Today's video is part of the Dosember collaboration. Search hashtag Dosember in YouTube for similar videos. And it comes with huge thanks to MonsterJoysticks.com, purveyors of the finest retro modern joysticks for many systems. Check them out at MonsterJoysticks.com and our good friends OneClickPrint.com. For your photo prints on canvas, acrylic, gifts, and a whole lot more, OneClickPrint.com. Hello cave dwellers, what I have to show you in today's Technible might just be the ultimate sound card for your retro PC. And before I tell you anything about it, as I slide it out with the bag here, how good does this thing look with those striking Nichicon caps on board there? And those are not cheap capacitors, I can tell you. And the surprising thing about this is that it's brand new. Yes, it's a brand new ISA sound card that's designed to learn the lessons from cards of the 80s and 90s and deliver everything we could possibly need in our retro rig. And do you know what? I think it might just deliver on that objective. So what is it? This is the Orpheus One sound card, a 16-bit sound card ideal for MS-DOS gaming, which is why I've broken out the Compact Tower PC to test it with. I just love this PC. And the card does also support Windows, but let's be honest, the ISA sound card era was mostly when Windows was where you knocked out your homework on Ami Pro, and DOS is where the real gaming happened. We're talking about the period of the late 80s, early 90s, up to around the mid 90s, when I was enjoying games like SimCity 2000 and its smooth jazz tones, accompanying my hard work fighting fires or ensuring your plumbing was connected. There were no bathroom accidents to be found in my cities, I can tell you. All the wonderful soundtracks of LucasArts or Sierra games, like Lucas's Day of the Tentacle, a particular favourite of mine that you often see on the channel. But how we enjoyed the music and the sound of these games varied greatly as a PC owner. We had to choose our oral weapons according to our budget. PCs didn't just have a standard sound chip like micros before them. Sound chips like Paula in the Amiga range or the SID chip, the famous SID chip in the Commodore 64. No, our options ranged from the bare minimum PC speaker, a simple beeper, through to the AdLib, Sound Blaster cards, external devices like the Disney Sound Source, and those with lots of cash to spare maybe had a combination of a premium sound card and the holy grail for DOS music, the Roland MT32 or the later SC55. Some examples of which can be seen here from the channel Control Alt Reese, a channel you should check out, because sadly I don't have an MT32. One day. So there were a lot of sound devices to choose from, and the very best in terms of quality and compatibility still hold a price premium today for retro gamers who simply must recreate that experience. And that's where this card, the Orpheus One, comes in. Designed by E. Ferriera and L. Dallas, as we can see there on the PCB. And there are links in the video description for the card and anything else that I talk about in this video. That's where this card comes in. And to explain how, we're gonna look now at the five most important features of the card, and of course, have a listen to each of those features as we do. Our first stop on the card then is this chip here, labelled Crystal on the lower right of the card. Just here, that's the Crystal CS4237B controller. Crystal is a name that dates back to the sunset of ISA DOS sound cards, and it's celebrated for its compatibility. And that is the key to a good modern retro experience. We buy these things for convenience and not to overly complicate things for ourselves. So that's a great choice. And the first thing that this card offers is full compatibility with AdLib, Sound Blaster, Sound Blaster Pro, and also WSS or the Windows Sound System. So I'm just setting it up here in Duke Nukem 3D. With all the settings turned up to the max, we've got the maximum voices, 16-bit sound, stereo sound, and in-game with the music off, it sounds like this. Uh, 
And the thing that immediately struck me about this was just how clean the sound was. There wasn't even the slightest hint of uh, crackle, interference, hum, nothing at all. When the disk drive was accessed, when the hard drive, the CD drives were accessed, nothing at all. It's just crystal clear. No pun intended with the crystal there, but it's super clear and it sounds great. So I'm really impressed right off the bat when I started testing this. It does also offer FM implementation for the music, which we'll come on to next. But right now, we're just listening for that digital audio. So we're off to a good start with crisp, clean, and widely compatible digital audio for our games. What have we got next? Well, let's talk about FM next, or frequency modulation. The very same FM that I subjected you to in the Yamaha CX-5M episode recently, and my musical skills that we must never talk about ever again. This card has not one, but two options in the FM department. There's the one built into the crystal chip, and then there's also a separate dedicated OPL3 FM chip, which is slap bang in the middle of the board here. Both are usable, and it's really easy to choose between the two of them. Setup of this card in DOS really is a breeze. You only need to call the AUF int executable. That initializes the card in DOS, just like Creative Labs only executable would with the Sound Blaster cards, but it pulls all of its settings in from an INI file. So there's no long command line switches that you need to work through and remember. Just tweak the settings right there in the INI file. And one of those settings is to select here between the Crystal and the OPL3 FM chip. So you just throw the executable into your auto exec batch file. When the PC boots up, it's configured exactly how you want it. So I've set it here to use the Crystal FM first so we can hear how that sounds like. I'll save the INI file, then reinitialize the card using a slash V on the executable. That gives us a more verbose output so that we can see there it is using the Crystal FM for this test. And this is how it sounds. And then if we go back into the INI file, we'll swap it over to the OPL3 chip. We'll then reinitialize. We don't need to reboot or anything. You can just run the executable again after tweaking the INI. And we can now hear that the OPL3 version of the same song sounds like this. I think that's a nice noticeable improvement and one that will make DOS gamers quite happy. I think it's really nice um, bump up. If you don't agree with me, you can choose the crystal. You can switch between them easily, but I like that. And that's not where it stops. If you want even more, of course, we now move on to general MIDI. You see, our card has a wavetable connector here, which to be honest, it's not, no great surprise. A, a quality sound card should have that of this period. And what you do with that is you put a daughter board on, you clip a daughter board onto that connector, and that daughter board basically contains everything that you might find in something like my sound canvas here, all on a nice little board to keep your PC nice and compact without things hanging out of it, or as compact as you can make a tower PC like this. Now, it would be nice to put something on that connector, wouldn't it? So how about this? Another fantastic modern day project for us retro PC fans. It's the Dream Blaster X2, and this is the top of the range Buran version, as they call it, which has 50 meg of sounds, a 64 meg, um, 64 meg of flash memory, so you can put your own sound fonts on there. It, it's, it just, it probably blows the SC88 out of the water with its more modern specs. And if we want to hear this in a game, all we have to do is choose General MIDI and choose the IO port of 300. And that's really nice because the external MIDI is still assigned to 330. So just like the OPL3 and the Crystal FM, you can select between the two. Nothing has been disabled, you've still got the options. So let's have a listen to that Dream Blaster. Let's get back to Duke Nukem and this is how it sounds.
and then we can combine the music with the digital audio for the a glorious harmony of it all together and it sounds like this hail to the king baby And here's another example in SimCity 2000. I think that sounds better than ever. I'm really impressed with that. It is, of course, an optional extra, that Dream Blaster, and an extra uh, expense that you might want to avoid if you're happy with the FM sound or if you've got an external device. And if you have got an external device, we're not done yet with this card. It has you covered for those. Now, things start to get serious here because at our next stop, we have an entire separate MIDI controller, an entire card, if you like, built in. The Crystal Chip does support external MIDI devices, but the additional chip that we have here offers something that real hardcore DOS gamers will love because it's 100% compatible with intelligent MPU 401. And some devices need that. They need the intelligent element. Um, I think the MT32 needs it. So some of them need that intelligent feature for it to actually play the right notes and the right instruments and not give you some horrible mess or the occasional bum note that stands out as being wrong. So it's really nice to have this built in there. Traditionally, you might have achieved that with a, a second dedicated card, the card from Roland or, or similar, but the PC MIDI project that's been applied to this is available as a standalone card or as they've done here brilliantly, built into the card for one perfect solution. Now I'm not actually using that because I'm so happy with the wavetable card that we've added in there. I think that sounds brilliant. So I'm not gonna plug it in. And also because I can't actually plug it in. Well, I can, but not using the cable that came with it. So there's this breakout MIDI cable that comes with it. And um, the way it's positioned on the card, when I've got it in my tower, I can't actually plug into it because of the overhang from the case here. Now, that's not the fault of the designers of the card. It's the fault of my case, but you should be aware of it because I'm sure others will run into that same problem. However, they really have thought of everything. There are jumpers on the board and you can use them to adjust which device goes to which MIDI output. So we can reassign the intelligent MPU um, to come out of the 15 pin MIDI port rather than the three and a half mil jack. They really have thought of everything with this. It's a great design and uh, that would be the solution if I wanted to use my sound canvas. The final thing I want to mention about this guard really is that the designers say the board has audio grade capacitors. That was those lovely orangey caps that we saw. And yes, I know they are not cheap caps at all. And it's a four layer PCB with particular attention paid to the analog outputs. In other words, they've worked so hard to suppress any noise, cracks, pops, interference, anything at all. And as I mentioned earlier, it really does shine through. It's a really nice sounding card. It's not something I was expecting to find in 2020 and I'm all the more surprised for finding it, but also the quality of the sound and all of the options in there. I like it. Can you tell? <laughs> I really do. So that I hope gives you a good overview of the Orpheus One sound card. At around 130 pounds, I understand that that is a premium price tag. It's not actually that bad. If you remember back to the cost of sound blaster cards back in the 90s, a premium top of the range sound blaster card would have cost you about 130 pounds, if not a bit more, allowing for inflation a lot more in today's prices. So I think it is a premium price, but I think it's a fair price for everything that this offers. If you try to find a Roland card for your intelligent MPU 401, and a decent Sound Blaster card, 
If you can find one on eBay, the prices are soon going to get up close to £130. So um, I think this is a really nice, convenient, modern day package. And the sound quality is just superb. I can't state that enough. I love the quality of the sound that comes out of this thing. You get yourself a Sound Blaster 16, an authentic Creative Labs one, you'll get pops and you'll get crackles and you'll get problems with hanging notes on the MIDI. There's all sorts of bugs and things in it and this just addresses everything. And I hope I've got that across in the video today. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. As always, if you're not subscribed, please take a moment to hit that subscribe button. Have you done it? Thank you very much. Give me a thumbs up or an Australian thumbs up. And as always, take care and I'll see you in next week's video. Bye bye.